very welcome. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. So thank you so much for making the time for us. I'm happy to be here. Mary, I would say that you are the foremost expert on empathy in the world. Well, that's very generous of you. I think I've been at it maybe longer in an intentional way than many people. So, Mary, before we get into empathy and how you teach empathy, how would you define what's empathy? Well, I consider empathy the ability to understand how another person feels and to be able to feel with them. I look at empathy as having a cognitive component, which is perspective taking, but also an affective component, which is emotion. So the two together um, are required in my definition of empathy, whereas many people consider cognitive empathy or perspective taking the whole package. And to me, the humanity of the affective side is required to really develop empathy. When did you get interested in it as a, let's say, research subject? I think my first interest came in 1981. I've been around a long time. And I had started um, Canada's first parenting programs for um, immigrant and um, mainly immigrant families who didn't know how to access the school system. And this was in Toronto, Canada. And then we expanded to allow all families to come in these neighborhoods. So these were in the poorest schools, the lowest performing schools. And what I came to realize as we became in good trusting relationships with families, these were families who came to the parenting programs with their babies and children before school age, that there was an epidemic of domestic violence and that children were being um, hurt they were being uh, physically and sexually um, assaulted. So I was horrified. There was nothing in my education or my upbringing to help me understand this. And what I realized very quickly was that the common denominator in all that suffering of violence was the absence of empathy. And then I realized working with parents and their little babies that this early first year of life where the baby is completely dependent on that relationship, that that was where empathy either bloomed or faded. So those two issues of realizing that the absence of empathy underscored violence and cruelty of all kinds, and that I believed that empathy was developed uh, through the loving attachment relationship, I put the two together. And in 1996, after all that learning at the foot of the families, realized that we can break that cycle of poor parenting and violence by bringing the attachment relationship to school so little children could see a model of what love looks like, find themselves in a baby, and then develop empathy themselves or ratchet up their level of empathy uh, if they landed lucky. And if they didn't land so lucky in life and they didn't have empathic parenting, they could develop empathy. So how would you Briefly describe, Mary, what's Roots of Empathy? Roots of Empathy is a classroom program in primary schools for children roughly about 5 to 11 years old in most places in the world. And the idea is that we work with a neighborhood parent and infant. The baby is only two to four months old when the program starts in the fall. And we train an instructor and there's a curriculum which is specialized for the age of the children. And over the school year, there's a nine different themes. We visit the classroom 27 times. And the children for nine of those times, they gather around a green blanket and they're coached to observe this tiny baby and the baby's parent or parents to understand what the baby's intentions are and what the baby's feelings are. So they're basically coached to find the humanity in this vulnerable little baby. And in finding the humanity in the baby, they're then coached to find their own humanity. So they learn what we call emotional literacy. Dan Goldman might call it emotional intelligence, but we are teaching children to understand the baby's feelings, to find the name for the baby's feelings. So the children learn very quickly that um, 
what this baby feels is something that they too have felt. And then to understand that their friends have felt it. So it brings everybody together. And when you can understand and recognize the emotional cues of your friends, it allows you to connect with them, to have a relationship. And in this world, if children learn how to relate to one another in school, we have a hope of peace. We have a hope of positive mental health. We have a hope of breaking cycles of violence and poor parenting. So we have proof that Roots of Empathy program reduces aggression and bullying and increases pro-social behavior or social emotional uh, competence. And that's huge in this world. Listening to you, you are, I mean, the work you have done for decades is kind of debunking a very extended myth mm -hmm. that says that there are some people that are born empathetic. Mm -hmm. They have this capacity to read other people's emotion and to put themselves in other people's shoulders. Mm -hmm. And there are people that they don't have that capacity. Mm -hmm. So basically doing this work with kids, mm -hmm. what you are proving is we all have that capacity, right? Yes, we all have the capacity to develop empathy. And our take on empathy is a little bit different in terms of how it's cultivated. So if it's the genesis of empathy is in the loving relationship between a parent and infant, how that baby is made to feel. That baby that the parent is able to recognize and provide the baby with the comfort and the warmth that the baby needs, the baby then loves themselves, feels lovable, can be lovable. Um, the idea that you can develop this capacity, it has to be experiential. There is no flashcard that you can hold up. There is no instruction that will make you empathic. It is a construction and it is based in an experience, a human experience. So we don't claim to teach empathy. We say basically it can't be taught in traditional instructional ways, but it can be caught. Every child knows when they're in the presence of love. It's seductive. It, it draws you in. It makes you smile without meaning to smile. So we are working with the most powerful relationship in the lifespan. We are working with someone who will give up their life for this baby, unconditional love. We are working with a secure attachment base, which is what launches us in life. Our position is not everybody gets a strong toehold on life, nobody's fault. But if we can do something to allow every child to, to experience what that's like without being given tests on it or feeling self-conscious or anything like that. You know, we've worked with children who have had terrible beginnings in life. Probably the child that sticks out in my mind most was a child who we came across in the late 1990s, so a very long time ago. And this child, when he was four, his mother was murdered in front of his eyes. And he got put into foster care and he kept getting moved around. Well, the reason he kept moving around because his behavior was unacceptable. And what people don't understand is children communicate to us how they feel through their behavior. They don't have words to say, nobody loves me. I don't know what to do. I'm scared. I don't want to sleep alone. I don't want to go to school. People tease me. Nobody, they don't know how to tell you that. They can identify that themselves. So this boy kept getting moved. So we had no anchors in life. He had no conscious memory of being loved. And the one day in the Roots of Empathy program, the mother had said to the children, you know, I always wanted a baby who'd be very cuddly and that you could dress up and, you know, she'd looked forward to that since she'd been a little girl. And who did she get but a very independent baby who did not want to be dressed up, was not cuddly. And when she would put the baby in the carrier, the baby would only face out this way and cry if she, she wanted to cuddle the baby. So the bell went and the mother said, would anybody like to try on the carrier? And this young boy who's now in grade seven, he put up his hand. Now he's two years older than all the other children because um, he kept getting moved. And every time you move, you lose education advantage. So he's two years older. He, 
he had shaved his head, he had a ponytail on the top. He was trying to look really harsh, like he didn't care about anything. And he put up his hand, he'd like to try it on, and everyone was a little bit surprised. And the kids put on their backpacks and they're going out for, for lunch, so no one was paying any attention. And when he got the carrier on, the Roots of Empathy instructor said to him, would you like to put the baby in the carrier? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. And the mother looked horrified. <laughs> <laughs> so didn't he put the baby in chest to chest? And didn't that baby mold to his body in spite of what the mother said that the baby wanted to look out? The baby had never been held by this boy before. He had seen the baby every time the mother came. The mother brought the baby to see each child around the circle at the beginning and again at the end. So he went into the corner and he had his arms around um, the baby in the carrier in that sort of seasick rock that he'd seen the mother do. So the mother's eyes never broke glance, checking that everything is good. And he came back after a few minutes and the children were all gone. And he said, when he's passed the, the little baby back to the mom, he said to the Roots of Empathy instructor, do you believe that if no one has ever loved you, that you could still be a good father? So I just don't think we have the right to give up on any child that they can come to conclusions themselves. That this was a child who thought, I will never bring a child into this world. It's a cruel world and no one's loved me. So I, I don't know how to love anybody. But through the year of Roots of Empathy, he came to believe that he could love, that he could be lovable too. So that boy was probably one of society's most wounded children. And he was able to find some of his own humanity. And I think, what is the purpose of public education? It's not just to produce literate people in the traditional sense. I think it's to produce citizenship. I think it's to produce people who have the capacity to relate to others. And I mean, we are now in a, a crisis of connection in society. What are we doing about it? Do you think that we are putting too much emphasis on the cognitive abilities of people and not paying attention, enough attention to our human beings, that we are human beings at the end and we have to, and we are social beings mm -hmm. and uh, we need connections and we need relationship in order to succeed actually, professionally, mm -hmm. but also personally. Yes, I think there is an overemphasis on cognitive achievement and STEM and all of those things. And what people are missing is that if you look at very young children, they learn through supportive or loving relationships. And it's no different as they grow up. Children need to feel seen and felt. Children need to feel encouraged. Children learn better in environments where they feel accepted, where they feel they belong. And we don't spend enough time on creating the kinds of relationships in the classroom. Teachers need to be aware of attachment teaching. With all our new knowledge about the deleterious impact of early adversity on children's competence, on their humanity, I guess, if you like, teachers need to have help in understanding how to have an approach of trauma-informed teaching, that you have to understand the circumstances of your children before you try to put stuff in them. You have to be open to be in relationship with them. And I think traditionally, teachers have been told to keep your distance professionally, not to hug children, you might be accused of sexually abuse, not to connect with them too closely, you'll lose your authority and you won't be able to hold discipline. Nonsense. You have to give yourself to the children. You have to embrace the children. You have to realize that if you're going to be a teacher, in order to teach, you have to reach. And how do you reach anybody? You have to see them. You have to see their vulnerability. You have to see their sense of humor. You have to see how precious they are. You have to recognize their individual uniqueness. And we don't teach our teachers that. The children learn through love. And you don't have to say you love every child, but you really do have to appreciate their abilities. Children will tell you their favorite teacher, 
was not always their most brilliant teacher, not always their most successful thing, the teacher who saw them, the teacher who understood them. So it's great. I love the emphasis on STEM to say that we're trying to build up girls' participation in STEM. What about building up boys' participation in humanity? We socialize our girls and boys differently in North America, in Europe. Girls are basically told to shut up and boys are told not to feel. And those messages are destructive. We have to be able to find one another, to be able to be in good relationship. And you can only do that if you've got empathy. These things that you are saying, they are too important to give them just to teachers. I mean, it's not my, my view is, it's not just the teacher's responsibility mm -hmm. to educate these people to be caring, mm -hmm. loving, and empathetic. Mm -hmm. I think that parents have a great role. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to tell me what you have seen mm -hmm. on the, how this relationship between parents mm -hmm. who are all the time overwhelmed with duties that they have to do on a daily basis, how that's affecting their relationship with the kids, their kids. Yeah, well, I think the landscape of childhood has changed dramatically. We're in a fourth industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence has changed the way many children will experience life and are experiencing life, but parenting, the landscape has changed. I think there's never been a more difficult time to be a parent or to be a child or to teach. And if you look at it, I think the most influential institution under the stars is the family. It gets no respect. Um, it gets very little help and it only gets attention when it fails. Education to me is the second most important institution because children spend so much time there and children's spirits can be broken or they can sail and bloom. I think teachers are hugely important and underappreciated in society. So I agree, we shouldn't say it's all up to the teachers, but we shouldn't also blame or shame parents we need to can create the conditions in society that are optimal for children. We have to decide what is the kind of society we want. Same thing with the climate. If you want to attack the whole issues around the climate and around education, you have to realize that without empathy, we are not going to do that because we have to care about the children unborn. We have to care about the children who don't live in our neighborhood. So how do you help the parents? So I've seen brilliant things happen with parents. I've seen brilliant things happen with teachers. But I, to, to address your question about what is it parents are doing and can do, I think parents underestimate their power. And it's a little bit frightening for someone to say it's all about you um, when nobody tells you how to do it. And I think parents have to realize that their love is the answer to almost every question. You know, when children have problems, when they're two, you can kiss away their problems. When they're five, you can't kiss away all their problems. And when they're 15, their problems are dangerous problems. And if you haven't started earlier on with good communication and helping children uh, reflect and unpack things, you've got a problem at 15. But when parents talk to their children, about what they're feeling and what they're seeing so that the children have the model of being, have seeing their parent as being vulnerable. And I mean, something as silly as saying at the dinner table, and we don't have very many dinner tables anymore, you know, there's, there's soccer classes and there's late work and there's all those things. So it might be the breakfast table, but whatever, when the family gathers, for parents who traditionally say, how did school go today? Children feel it's an interrogation and they're not interested in sharing, that's done. But if the parent says, I had a big challenge at work today, I was really embarrassed because I didn't get my project in or I got the wrong, you know, wrong slant on things. If the parent is able to share a little bit of their humanity, a little bit of their disappointment, a little bit of a negative emotion, it, the parent, although they don't believe it, are the children's idols. 
The children want to be like the parents. The children love the parents more than anybody in the world. You know, if the parent is able to give a model of how to have a discussion about some disappointing or hurtful thing or an embarrassment or anything that makes you seem a bit vulnerable, it opens the child up to say, I had to make an answer in school today and people laughed at me. Well, for the parent to say, yeah, I remember that, um, it creates uh, emotional literacy openings. Emotional literacy is not just having the names for your emotions. It's about being able to recognize them in others and to be fluent in discussing them. So parents can build that up in children naturally and then to the perspective taking or the cognitive aspect of, of empathy. Parents do that all the time. Even when you're watching television, you say, oh my gosh, I really wonder how he felt in that moment. Or what do you think that was like for them? So the children, you're saying, you're sharing, you're leading, and the children are having a chance to be an authentic dialogue, which involves emotion and cognition. And that is more powerful than any teacher trying to coach the children. They don't forget that a time when their parents shared some kind of vulnerability. Now, we were talking about the power of words in order to uh, build this emotional literacy. But I have heard you talk many times about how important physical contact mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And it's something that not only kids, also adults, mm -hmm. we are not doing it enough. Mm -hmm. Actually, like to touch people, it's seen like aggressive or you are intimidating, you are invading my personal space. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to talk about that. What are the benefits mm -hmm. of this physical interaction with babies and with young kids? Well, I also would extend your question to middle-aged people and elderly, we yes. all crave touch. And, you know, of all the senses, when a little baby is developing, uh, the sense of touch is the most powerful sense that helps them integrate. Because when babies are first born, they're, they're, dis, they're not connected inside, you know. <laughs> Feeling and thinking are the one. Uh, cognition and emotion are inextricably linked. They can't sort out the difference. The sense of touch is the most integrating sense. So we say to the children, watch the mommy, be detectives, tell us what mommy is doing. So typically the mother will pick the baby up. So what you have happening there in terms of touch, you have warmth, you have pressure, it's called proprioception and movement totally reassuring to the baby. And then in all likelihood, the mother's cheek is touching the baby and the children will report this, but the mother might also be saying, shh, 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 shh. So the baby has the scent of the mother, the sound of the mother, the sight of the mother, but of all these sensory inputs into self-regulation or emotional regulation, touch is the most profound. So if you look at the work of Dr. Tiffany Field out of Miami, many years ago, she had a premature baby. And she used to put her hand in through the, the preemie sort of uh, a container and stroke her baby. And she found out that it wasn't just touch, but it was pressure. And her research on this whole, uh, she was a neuroscientist, her research found that the ability to touch and in a massage way, gently to massage a baby, got babies out of hospital six days earlier because they thrived with the loving touch. It was healing. It was loving and it saved billions of dollars, right, in the system. So knowing that with little babies, aren't we all bigger babies? Yeah. So we do know that there is comfort in grief, don't we always reach out and touch one another? In joy, don't we hug one another? In disappointment, don't we seek one another and through touch, whether it's a hand or the deepest way we can show comfort or to share any of the emotions is touch. So why we um, make ourselves antiseptic in society is beyond my comprehension. 
in um, in your culture, you do a much better job of it. <laughs> you know, we we feel that um, it's an invasion, as you said, of our personal privacy if you touch someone. I have a friend who came from Brazil, and he said his two little girls felt starved for touch when they moved to North America because no strangers ever said nice little girl or or in any way greeted them. We don't kiss one another, we don't hug one another, um, unless we're family or close friends. So I think there is a powerful dynamic in touch so that in the Roots of Empathy program, every little child in the classroom touches the baby twice. And this is a benefit not only for the children, but for the baby. So as the baby is sung around, so here you combine music, which is again, a human connector. So you're building um, solidarity in the classroom so that the, all the children in the classroom feel happier, feel more accepting, feel more collegial. So this idea of touch and the scarcity of touch or the poverty of touch is a problem in society. In Britain, they had a minister for loneliness and she only lasted in that position for six months before she resigned, but she and I had a very meaningful talk. And she was fully aware and wanted to address the poverty of touch for the elderly people and teenagers. Because teenagers very often um, feel self-conscious about touch. And now we have this um, new phenomena where young people are living alone in very small spaces at a higher level than any ever before. So they don't have the opportunities to be in community, to feel touch, and we lose a little bit of ourselves if we don't have that. How does this contribute to the empathy crisis that you mentioned, Marie? Mm -hmm. Well, we really do have an empathy crisis in society. Um, our values have changed somewhat. We are less in community. We, um, we really, I think, are at risk of not being able to solve the problems which are uh, in this world, big problems. How are we going to manage the fact that there are 65 million people who are on the march looking for homes, that we are going to have um, climate disasters where there will be refugees, climate refugees. So we have to be able to find the humanity in the other. We have to be able to realize that we share this common humanity, which is our capacity to feel. And if we don't take advantage of that, we will continue with this crisis of connection where we keep missing one another in the world. We don't find a way by which to connect. And a, a, an interesting study came out of the University of Michigan about six, seven years ago. Dr. Sarah Conrath compared university students in the 70s to university students of the uh, 2000s. And she found a disturbing drop of um, empathic concern, 40-something um, percent. And again, another equally disturbing percentage of perspective taking. And these are the two aspects that really make up empathy. And if you have that dramatic reduction in your educated population, what does that say about North America? And is that a marker for the rest of the world? So I think really the crisis of connection needs to be addressed through building empathy by intentionally finding ways for school children. Every child goes to school in a developed world. What can we do rather than just ensuring that they're literate in traditional ways? They need to be emotionally literate. They need to be able, you know, does morality count? Well, empathy is related to morality. And this crisis of connection is being played out in many fields. We need to be able to find ways to connect to one another, to be able to read the feelings, to find our common humanity. Where is it? It's there. Mary, you have developed this extraordinary method that, as you said, it's helping a lot of uh, children. But how did you, how did it work for you 
I mean, when you were at school, when you were kindergarten, none of this was available. So how did you learn about all these things yourself? How did you experience all these things yourself? Um, I think looking back on it, I had an unusual childhood. I thought it was a very normal, boring childhood. I had no tragedy, no drama, but I had unusual experiences. For example, my mother used to invite anyone who got out of prison to come to our house for their first dinner. And she used to deliver clothing and food to people who didn't have enough. And this would be after school, and very often I'd go with her and help. We would have a cup of tea with the people to whom she delivered the clothing or the, the coal or the food, and their circumstances would be desperate. And we would sit at their kitchen table in the squalor. And my mother was one with them. And I learned from her that we are all the one in our humanity, that we're only one step away from trouble, that the person who got out of prison was no different from us. People who are living in such poverty were no different from us. Their circumstances were different. And I think I grew up raging after social justice. Why? It's not fair. I remember saying to my mom, it's not fair. And um, she, she couldn't find words to tell me, you know, what you can do about it. And she did something about it in her quiet way. And um, I think my mom had enormous empathy for people and no judgment. And I think that had a big effect on, on what I saw about life and how I could make things fair. My dad also had a very interesting sense of our position in the world. I grew up in Newfoundland, which is a small province in the sort of the most eastern tip of North America and a poor province. We were not sophisticated. We were not rich. But he would, you know, take the globe out and get me to pick a place. And he would put in an envelope to put into church the next, you know, on Sunday, where that little bit of money would go to help and what was their problem there? And would explain to me, well, you can't have your party shoes because the money is going to help little girls who don't have any shoes. So I had a very real sense that I could make a difference in the world. I had no idea where these countries were, but I had a sense that through my dad, I could make a difference. And he would take me to visit um, people who were in hospital, older men who were in hospital or in old age homes on Sunday morning. These were vulnerable people who through no fault of their own were lonely. And my dad was showing me that I could do something to help. So when I saw all of these problems and I thought empathy was the answer to them, and I mean, there was an intergenerational cycle to these problems. It just kept going on and on. And why don't we do something? And if I figured out that empathy is the answer, why don't I do something? I realized the one day I went to visit one of the teenage mothers I'd been working with and she'd been beaten up again. Her eye was cut. And um, I said to her, what happened? And she's holding her little infant in her arms, a little girl. And her other little toddler, little girl is on her leg. And she said, Mary, he didn't mean it. He told me he's sorry. He promised he'll never do it again. He even cried. So in her books, that was okay. He could keep beating her up because he cried. She was 16 with two children. Her mother and her grandmother um, both had been victims of domestic violence. And she was not able to protect her children from abuse. So I thought, these two little girls are going to grow up to expect that this is what love feels like. So it was on my way home from that, in, a, in rage, not normally good things are born out of rage. I had tears of rage that I was not going to let those two little girls and all those other little people grow up expecting that love hurts, that 
we can break that cycle of intergenerational violence. You have been um, um, working on it for many, many years. And I know that Root of Empathy is in many different countries around the world. And you told me that you wanted to also start the program in uh, Spanish-speaking countries, including Spain, mm -hmm. in a couple of years. So mm. that's, that's amazing. But do you feel that you are battling alone or do you have allies, supporters, other organizations mm. working with you? Well, we certainly do have allies and organizations. It's about value systems. Uh, because we work in school systems, we don't actually do any marketing or advertising, which I know it sounds crazy, but we find we're a charity and we want to put all of our energies into delivering the program where people already want it. So the biggest, I think, challenge is that school systems have to realize that for children to thrive and be happy and to be productive citizens when they grow up, to have positive mental health and well-being, they need empathy. The other problem, obviously, is money. Who cares about this? Governments help a lot in um, Canada and in some European countries, not in the United States. Um, very often, if a Ministry of Education in a country has recognized that there are problems um, around mental health and well-being in childhood, around bullying, and that we have evidence that we can increase uh, the capacity of children's well-being and mental health and that we can reduce bullying and those sorts of things. They want us because we can do that, check that box. But um, I guess it's a, a purpose. We have to have shared purpose. And we go to places where they want us and where we can find funders to support us. We get funding in countries like Ireland because children have committed suicide because of bullying. Well, we know we can reduce bullying dramatically. And it lasts because children realize that if I hurt you, I know what that's going to feel like. So it's a break against hurting others. People say that roots of empathy children hurt less and help more. Well, is that not something to aspire to? Mm. So, um, I tend not to look at the challenges, but to steam ahead. If we get an invitation, we say, okay, who do you think might get this and help you? And in Spain, we're very helpful, very hopeful, I should say. We've already got a funder down the way, and we've got some schools that are, are interested. Marie, besides Roots of Empathy, you have another program. There is Seeds mm. of Empathy. Mm. What's it? Um, Seeds of Empathy is for younger children, and um, we also do a lot of work on early literacy, and, but in a very loving, playful way. And it's not about learning the alphabet, it's about um, excitement, about learning of story, about speaking and listening, about connecting to one another in all of these ways, and the big thing in Seeds of Empathy, it's teaching and enabling the childcare workers or the teachers to realize that their relationship with the child is the vehicle for the child's learning. So it's really professional development for them. And yes, there's a big curriculum. And our most recent location is the kindergartens in Hamburg, where we're training um, the, um, the staff, the teachers who work with the childcare, they call it kindergarten there, um, so that they will have the materials that will enable them to show the children how much they love reading this story with them and how much fun it is, and to make learning fun and to have the social and emotional component around the baby. So the younger you start children on being becoming emotionally literate, the better. So we have plans for research down the road where you take the children who have been in a Seeds of Empathy program when they're between three and five years of age. And then you see how they do when they go to formal education and have roots of empathy. 
in both programs, the, the parent and the baby are central. Mm. So how did you select them? I mean, what are the parameters, let's say, if I can call it that way, mm -hmm. you measure mm -hmm. to say, okay, this parent and mm -hmm his or her children are a good role model? Because at the end, you are using them as a role model. Yes. yes. Well, it's a tricky thing because who are we to say who has a secure attachment relationship? Exactly. And we work with a secure attachment relationship because um, that is the best model under the stars of empathy. So um, we say to the school where we're working, um, is there a family that you have been working with where you know the mother is about to have another baby in the summertime um, so that that mother might be a Roots of Empathy mother? So they know if the family is a happy family or you know the, the parents are engaged positively with the school, there's a very good chance that that parent would have a secure attachment with the baby. So if that's the case, the school says to the parent, we're having this program, Roots of Empathy, would you be interested? We send the parent information. Then when the person is trained, the Roots of Empathy instructor goes and visits with that parent in their home and explains what it's all about. And they have a chance to be with the family for a little bit, to see how the parent interacts with the baby. And really what we're looking for is responsiveness. So this relationship is so powerful. Um, parents feel very proud. Parents appreciate how important they are to their baby. Parents learn very deeply about their, the baby's innate temperament, which nobody tells them about. You know, like if you've got a very intense baby who cries easily, long, who's hard to calm down, that's not because you're a bad parent. That's because you have an intense baby and it's a genetic predisposition. You know, you had said earlier, is empathy something that is inherited? Well, the whole epigenetic story of um, neuroscience um, has shed new light on our capacity to, um, you know, have gene, genes expressed in an experience change and morph a little bit, and that can be passed on. So I think, you know, the same thing with temperament traits. They are genetically predisposed, all of us are that, you know, come with the capacity to see the world in unique ways. And um, for parents in the Roots of Empathy program or the Seeds of Empathy program, it's extremely liberating to know that just because you can't get your child into routines and they don't sleep regularly, you're not a disaster. You're not a bad <laughs> parent. It means your child has low rhythmicity. So all of these things are win-win for the children who are learning that they also, um, whatever their temperament traits are, they're not um, moral flaws. If you have temper tantrums, it means you have high intensity and you need help with that. Um, so this attachment relationship and a secure attachment is reinforced when parents realize that the baby they got is not necessarily the baby they ordered and that they themselves are not necessarily the parents they thought they might be. That um, we're working with this relationship, this attachment relationship really is hugely important and none of us are instantly brilliant at it. So to have a whole group of children who are so fascinated and to work with an instructor who's experienced with it is um, very supportive to the parent. How do you see yourself in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Well, I'm of an age now that I could retire, <laughs> but I feel I've never really worked because <laughs> I've, I've always loved what I've done. And I feel it's a privilege to do what I do. I get to work with amazing people who are helping to change the world. So my feeling is for the last five years, I have had a plan for if I'm hit by a truck, um, we have people who can take over. It doesn't just depend on Mary. And I think the problem with any founder 
of an organization that they can think it's all about them. And you have to make sure that you've developed something that is sustainable beyond an individual. And we certainly, it's not all about Mary, it's all about the idea. So we have made sure that we're bulletproof, that I can step aside and we have other people who can fit into everything. I rarely travel alone. I take someone with me to see how we work, how we build relationships, how we fundraise, all of those things, so that it's not dependent on me. I want to be here on the ground, in the plains to get to wherever people want us to be. As long as I have the energy to do it, I want to be able to do it. I should slow down a little bit, I know, because <laughs> my husband would like more of my time. And since I've become a grandmother, it's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. So my definition of a good week has changed a bit. I like to be able to give a bath. So I have to try and get home. I travel a lot, um, but I would very much like to be doing the same and maybe doing it more broadly and having different aspects of empathy. So introducing empathy in different ways to different populations. Mary, thank you so much. My pleasure.